And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome reporter at Quartz, Sarah Kessler. Hello. Um, so this next panel is going to be about automation and work. Um, and we have a lot of great people who are on the panel who I think they're going to send out now, and I can introduce them. Um, so, so yeah, I guess first we have um, Stefan Verholst, uh, who is a head research at the GovLab at NYU and also a senior advisor and the former head of research at the Markle Foundation. Um, we also have Peter Hirschberg, who's the co-founder of the Maker City Project, which helps cities prepare for technological change. Um, we have Emma Nicole, who's a government specialist at LinkedIn and helps governments brand themselves to attract talent. Um, and then you all know uh, Steve Levine from the last panel, uh, who until recently was my colleague at Quartz and now is the editor of the future at Axios. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I wanted to start um, by kind of getting a read on how you feel about automation and how it will impact workers. Because as I talk to people about this, I find that there's a pretty wide spectrum uh, for the reaction to this idea that uh, machines and algorithms are replacing workers. And it ranges from, this is the worst thing in the world, like everybody should buy a bunker, um, install universal basic income, because there's no work left for humans to do and it's going to be terrible. Um, to on the other end, like, isn't this a great opportunity? Like, this is the end of menial work, or maybe we won't even have to work, and everyone's <laughs> going to do what they love in a creative way. So um, I'll start with Stefan, and if you can just place yourself on that spectrum of optimism to pessimism. Um, it's a great question, but I, I would say I'm probably somewhere in the middle, and it always reminds me of. Uh, Charles Dickens, who basically said it's the worst of times and the best of times. And I think that's pr probably what we are in today uh, with regard to automation and especially with regard to the impact of technology on jobs. Uh, so on the one hand, clearly certain population um, segments will suffer, especially those who don't have uh, a certain educational attainment, which, by the way, in the US is about 70% who don't have a college degree. And I think those are the ones that might be affected uh, the most. But on the other hand, um, clearly there are new pathways and new kinds of jobs that are emerging as a result of technology that we don't yet know. But that will require, of course, a whole redesign of how you um, get the education and especially how you identify what kind of skills are necessary. OK, Peter? Well, this is clearly the maybe the biggest economic change in our history, certainly the biggest since the Great Migration and Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely no small thing. Um, I, I live in Silicon Valley, which has become increasingly alarmed about this. I think Silicon Valley suddenly with this sense of, oh my God, we're going to throw everybody out of work, and then you talk to economists and people think it goes slower. The thing I'm optimistic about is actually cities and all of this. I think that the, the place that actually retrains people, works on new forms of work, uh, uh, creates innovation centers and new forms of factory cities are the places where we run a lot of these experiments. And the, the one place I think it would be awful to look for what to do about this would be national government, because how would you know what to do top down at a time of change? And I'm very optimistic that, that, that all forms of cities and young people working together will kind of come up with the new forms of doing things. And, and so what we really need to do is look to clues that, that come out of the robotics, come out of the AI community, come out of cities, and then figure out how to scale that stuff. Uh, so I'm long on running experiments, uh, and that makes me optimistic. Nice. I would say, personally, uh, I would be a little bit nervous considering my job, uh, my day job, is helping governments to actually recruit people. So what will I do if, uh, if those organizations need a lot less people? Will I be out of a job myself? Um, however, you know, working for you know, a Silicon Valley startup and how uh, the disruption and the change in, in that whole space has really you know, encouraged you know, me and my sector to continue to grow and, and create work, I think that the, uh, the long-term view is positive for sure. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as you suggested, the, the, the opinion runs all over the place and, and the short answer is no one really knows. 
and there is great pessimism, great unease about this, and, and that's that we're heading into a uh, existential crisis, no one is working, and all of the outcomes of, of that, the social outcomes, uh, geopolitical outcomes, and then, and then on the other side, the great optimists who say, well, we've al always worked ourselves through these for the last 200 years. I, I, well, one thing that everyone agrees on, whether uh, you're on one side or the other, is that there is going to be a space. There's going to be a space of a few years or of decades. Remember, it was six decades during the 19th century of, uh, uh, of adjustment from the Luddites until people were, were fully em employed and, uh, and incomes going back up. And, and, and so uh, if we all agree that there's going to be a great period of, of, of real trouble, in, uh, uh, bef even if we do get to uh, a utopian stage, um, we've got to figure out what we're going to do for those years or decades till we get there. And on that note, um, you know, a lot of people who think about this talk about it as though it's inevitable and that the appropriate reaction is to find ways to adjust policies to address this kind of inevitable change that we're going to experience, you know, whether or not we know what it looks like. Um, Steve recently wrote an article in which he argued that it's not inevitable and that we should um, do something to kind of tamper the effects of automation on jobs. And, and so Steve, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that idea. Yeah, so my, uh, my own reaction as, as, as a consumer of this news a few months ago wa was, well, if we're heading in, into, into this dystopia, uh, do we control technology or does it control us we, we uh, intervene, in, we attempt to intervene in climate change, uh, nuclear war, bioterrorism, and, and, and so on. Why are we not intervening in, the, in, this, in this future uh, in, wi in which we're under the thumb of robots? And, and I did go around, I went around to um, uh, technological ethicists and historians and scientific um, uh, uh, historians who just ask their opinion on this. No, not one person thought it was a good idea to stop the robots, or, the, or that it was even possible to do that. But, but um, a number of people did throw out their ideas of how uh, the worst outcomes uh, that are foreseen can be slowed or, or, uh, or at, at least curbed. And uh, among them um, that I found interesting was uh, a, a, a former uh, senior in, in intelligence officer with, with the CIA. And his, um, his solution was required human content. Was that, that, that just as in an oil country, in a, uh, in a petroleum pr producing country like Nigeria, for example, when a foreign company goes in, it, it has to employ a certain percentage of locals in, or, uh, in, in, its, in its plants that, there, that when a factory is opened, that it has to have a certain amount of human content. And obviously a lot of people are not a huge fan of ideas about you know, preventing companies from adopting technology in any certain spaces. And there's also arguments about um, like when the power loom was introduced, for instance, it actually ended up creating more jobs, even though it replaced craftsmen who used to work on manual looms, um, because the demand for cloth as the price dropped shot up so high that there were more people producing more cloth, um, and those jobs became skilled jobs and became better jobs, and so why don't we just let this run its course, and that might be what happens in this case, too. Um, so aside from kind of the efforts to, to just say, like, we're going to try to not necessarily completely stop, but somehow tamper this, like, what do you think is the appropriate, um, for the rest of you on the panel, policy response um, from, you know, is it uh, universal basic income? Is it um, giving people budgets to reskill themselves? Like, what would you like to see? 
And Stefan, we'll start with so you. So I think, yeah. meaning in addition to um, automation and, of course, globalization, which, by the way, by many are seen as, as more threatening than uh, automation, based upon the study that we've done with uh, uh, Pew um, lately, um, we also have a challenge in the, um, uh, the whole labor market environment. Uh, basically, the labor market is very untransparent. And so the question, and my recommendation would be, is to make uh, the labor market, A, more transparent, and B, more skill-based, by which I mean that from the supply side, i.e. individuals, really have no real good way to express what they know, what skill they have, that then can match the demand side, which, by the way, also has no good way right now to express what skills they require, because anyone who has lately led any kind of job description, that hasn't really changed over the last, anyway, X amount of years, and so a job description is a really, currently a really bad way to signal the demand. And then, when you have a more transparent supply side and a demand side, it's very hard to match that in a meaningful way right now. Plus, if you want to aspire a certain job, and you know a certain kind of skill sets, at the moment it's also very hard to even get the education to then get the job that you want to have and have a career path. So my recommendation would be is to make this triangle where you have the supply, the demand, and education far more transparent and in sync with each other in order to really address the challenges that we have. Yeah, I would absolutely build on that, that we also need a common language between you know, individual workers and the organizations that are going to provide them opportunities to you know, generate economic opportunity for themselves. I see a lot of times this idea of organizational uh, definition of a job title being something that's um, untranslatable into you know, the types of skill sets they're struggling to find. Uh, particularly looking at uh, cities, counties, and states where they have large gaps and uh, jobs that are going unfilled in healthcare, in education, uh, particularly in the sort of correction space, and they want to evolve themselves into rehabilitation centers, and they need people who might have originally thought of going into care work or education, that those kinds of people would never ever consider their skills to be, uh, you know, translatable or, uh, uh, you know, providing them growth into uh, corrections organizations. But in fact, uh, if those job descriptions were reframed and built around the skills that they're looking for to evolve, uh, I think the whole community would benefit for sure. If I might uh, build on this, we talk about automation and AI and robots as a thing that will in the future disrupt the markets. You could argue this last election was our first election that was about automation. Now. Um, Many of the people who became Trump supporters because we're very dis disillusioned about the lack of work were blaming foreign trade or Mexico or NAFTA, but in fact the data shows about 85% of those jobs went away because automation or it was moved to a cheaper part of the U.S., only 15% overseas, but it was easy to work, it, it's easier to hold someone who doesn't look like you accountable and if you go talk to auto workers they actually thought it was, it was the Mexicans' fault and they actually liked robots because they thought that would hold out the possibility of a, of a better job or more training and, and they, perhaps they didn't realize so few people actually have those jobs. So th this suggests that, as you point out, today there's enormous inefficiencies in education in the job market because we designed high school for the factory era. We designed school as something that ended when you finished going to school, and yet we now know, no matter what happens, you're going to have to new, learn new skills all the time. Education is going to be lifelong. It'll be a subscription. Um, uh, so policy responses that not only create micro-credentials and tighten the feedback loop between the thing you learn and getting a job. Um, if you went to uh, Mahoning County, Pennsylvania, which is where Youngstown is that broke for Trump that had a, a lot of the displaced workers, they would tell you retraining is a four-letter word because it's a broken promise, because you'd get retrained, but the job wasn't there. So that's a really inefficient, uh, that's an inefficient feedback loop. And some of the most hopeful stuff is then, how can we start building some of this retraining or mentoring actually into the robots themselves? So when we think of a robot, we tend to think of, there's this machine that does something repetitively, and out of 100, eight of us will be left to run it. Um, if you talk to Autodesk that builds Dreamcatcher, which is software that helps you generatively design something, so you come up with an idea and it designs it, 
you mentor it, and then it starts mentoring you with new skills. The machines and some of the most sophisticated machine shops teach the workers the skills in real time, collapsing this huge inefficiency we have in education. So it would suggest areas like that are areas of hope, and we, we're probably hugely, probably the biggest national security issue we have is how would we deal with this. That would suggest you may not need a new deal that creates jobs, but you need something that keeps people rapidly skilled and I think one of the great crimes of the last election is nobody brought that up. Uh, Bernie Sanders brought up socialism and Donald Trump brought up your jobs from the coal era and, and Hillary was accused of, of not liking the people who were deplorables, but what never got on the table was there's important work to be done here. And I mean, Steve, did you have something else to say? On that? No, no, I just, uh, just from f what was not said during the election um, and what is going to happen uh, if, from the population when it realizes that it wasn't Mexico, that it wasn't NAFTA, um, are we going to have another Luddite uprising? Um, that's one issue. Uh, but the other issue is uh, that, that we're not, uh, we haven't thrown into the equation is our aging population. Uh, we're not growing as fast and we're getting o older so the question is, do in fact we need robots to take that space? Well, I mean, I think if there was anything discussed, uh, which is on the education part, and I, I agree with the aging element as well, is that still the debate is much about having access to college. I mean, that was, uh, that was and is still quite often a popular topic, and, and lower the cost, which of course is uh, uh, gigantic. Um, but much of the... Uh, um, jobs at stake and the future jobs that will be created are middle skill jobs. And so they don't really require a college degree automatically. And frankly, what we have, which again goes back to my um, lack of transparency about what you need and what you, uh, uh, what you have, much of the, uh, um, the current description and what you need is always automatically in terms of you need a degree as opposed to you need a kind of skills. And so again, part of the challenge that we have is to A, how do you get educational attainment beyond a four-year college degree, which is always seen as nirvana, despite the fact that most of the jobs quite often require uh, a different kind of training than just a college degree? And how do you then reflect that in terms of the skills that are required? And how do you get it in, a, in an ongoing fashion? Because clearly, um, uh, ad ongoing adult learning will be part of the, uh, um, the way forward, part of the future of work, kind of landscape, but it, it doesn't, anyway, it's infe unfeasible to require someone to ju just stop uh, uh, for two years and, re and, and acquire a new degree, for instance. So you will have to have new ways of uh, educational attainment, microcredits and, and that kind of stuff, but that's really uh, was ignored at the campaign trail, and much of the debate is still about having access to college degrees, which frankly is a different debate, an important debate, but it doesn't deal with the real challenge at hand from my point of view. And we keep coming back to um, education, which has been kind of an answer to this problem for decades and decades. You know, in the 60s, there's a report about how um, you know, the cyber revolution was coming and computers were going to take over jobs and so we should have a massive re-education of the workforce, um, which doesn't seem to have mobilized. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, aside from education, are there things that we should be thinking about? And also, is this time different, which is what this debate comes down to a lot of times when you look at past um, technological and revolutions and how we've recovered from them, like, does this time merit a different response which would be bigger than education? I, I might suggest that what we think of as education won't look like education anymore, and that may be part of the problem. We still have it like, you, you, there's education and then you go to work. Mm -hmm. But as we know, um, the tools today are so powerful. Obviously, the fact that college students are starting companies all the time is some indication that, that things are changing the labor market. Um, uh, when I talk about cities, I'm optimistic about things like in Pittsburgh, in the Elizabeth Forward School District, they smashed art, computer science, and shop together from second to eighth grade. And so the first thing that happened is kids became much less bored and they were on their, on their mobile phones less because it didn't look like work, it looked like play and they were making things and solving problems and designing things. 
and they were learning skills and they were eighth graders were solving the problems of the second graders because they were using 3D printers and code and all sorts of stuff. And the biggest problem they ran into is when the kids got out of high school, the community colleges and the colleges weren't ready because the kids already knew that stuff. And the, and the kids in, in school were actually like, if they saw some problem, they were solving it. It was indistinguishable from work and you know, it's not too far distance from there to Kickstarter. In Louisville, Kentucky, General Electric has a micro factory um, where people come and hack appliances. Like, they just, they just came up with ideas of uh, what if we turned an oven, turned off the latch that's self-cleaning and turned it into a pizza oven? What if we made new kinds of coffee makers? So you'll see hundreds of people in a space with the 3D printers and laser cutters and all sorts of stuff coming up with ideas and putting them on Kickstarter and the University of Louisville sends students over, they get paid, it looks like an internship but they're working on projects and it's kind of this whole fluid facility where people are learning to build something in a factory and if it works, GE has a new product and that's good because it used to cost them $40 million to bring a product to market. So here's something that combines uh, a little bit of education, a little bit of what we called an apprenticeship. You get paid, it's good for the community, and a big company has found it can farm work out to a group of people, and it's less expensive than the old way of doing R&D. So that's one example of mushing these things together. And when I say I love to see a lot of experiments, like no one predicted that, and that's probably not even the best way of doing it, but if things like that went on in a lot of cities, we'd learn a lot, and it might provide some answers to these questions. Yeah. And so, Peter, do you think those stories are getting out to the workforce? Um, I think it's just beginning to. I okay. think that's a lot of the work to be done. Uh, yeah. Marsha and I just wrote a book called The Maker City in which we looked at 100 cities doing this interesting work. Yeah. And yesterday, that's Marsha, say hello to Marsha. And my other co-author was Dale Doherty who founded Maker Fair and Maker Media. Um, we just launched a project yesterday with US News. You may know of US News because they rank schools and they rank hospitals. And we're going to measure and rank every US city on their forward-looking economic potential. And we're putting together, you know, what does it mean to do that? So we, we have to look at uh, innovation centers and the growth of supply chain and the, spe the connection point between education and jobs, like how efficient. So we're trying to come up with a bunch of those measures. So I think it's just getting out there. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts because like at some point when people realize that perhaps the promise of the election isn't met, you know, aside from social revolt, do you think we'll just be ready for a lot more experimentation or will we just all yell at each other? <laughs> See, the future uh, is somehow uh, 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 seeable in the past. We've been yelling a lot at each other. <laughs> um, but, but I do think, I do think that, that the answer, that you've got the answer right there. So, so I've got two daughters, two, two teenage daughters, and, and uh, when I talk to people who are, who are doing this, who are in the field, robotics or AI, and they're, and they're thinking of, about jobs, they, that's the first question all of them get asked. What, what should I tell my daughter or son to go into? And, uh, and, and, and the one that makes the most sense to me when, uh, when, I, uh, when I'm listening is, is liberal arts, right? So just get a great, stuff your brain fill, uh, full of stuff. But as soon as we get rigid with our policy yeah. prescriptions, uh, that's where we'll go wrong. And if we're flexible uh, and, and experiment, uh, and provide financial wherewithal for people to do things, uh, we may get, uh, get out of this uh, a lot less wounded uh, than we otherwise would. I asked that question because it made me think about influences in, in the professional sphere. And, you know, we, we all have heard about the, uh, you know, the famous influencers that are constantly selling us stuff, but, you know, what about the types of people who have taken an unconventional kind of approach to their career and kind of form pathways for, you know, students or, you know, uh, other people in the workforce to think laterally about where do I go next? So, you know, I think this whole idea about having, uh, having an opinion and, and building a personal brand and really being able to, to use your voice as really the, uh, the, the next wave of the, of the resume, you know, I'm hearing more and more about people finding, you know, their next career move or identifying uh, an industry they never thought to work in by using their, their own, uh, I guess, uh, voice and, and their own perspective to, to share stories and then be uh, making connections. And I think this whole connected network of, you know, where to next for the, the economy is, is, is a big, big thing to be thinking about. 
but it still require, I don't know, I mean, it still require um, some some new kind of infrastructure because yeah. e even if you have the maker, mm -hmm. which I think is a great concept, a maker city or a maker movement, it does require some validation at a certain point in time that uh, you've acquired certain kind of skills, yeah. and then uh, you need to have basically a labor market that values those skills and that acknowledges that kind of validation. And so you do need to have still uh, uh, some mechanism uh, where you can A, validate what you've acquired, B, share that in a manner that others can see or have a signal that actually is valuable, and then also connect that with a career path because it's not only about just having a job, yeah. it's really about being able to progress all over time and then you need to know in order to get a career path based upon what skills I have that are validated or not validated, how do I get to that next path? Because uh, the big um, tragedy quite often is that many get stuck yeah. right? and, and, and then uh, really have a hard time getting out of their uh, middle skill quite often job and really grow to the next career and that's where um, Markle has been uh, uh, experimenting with around skillful where you really have this kind of understanding together with LinkedIn yeah. understanding about what is your portfolio of skills what is the career that you can aspire to and how do you get additional kinds of e either experience or skills in order to get on that career path and it does require some coaching yeah. which by, by the way is the, quite often the missing element of education um, to really help uh, those get on that career path. Okay. So even when the question is about policy, the answer is still education. And we talked a lot about <laughs> like the format of education. Um, you know, maybe it should be thought of as more of an ongoing thing rather than a certificate. Um, you know, maybe companies have some role in continuing education and applying it to practical problems. Um, maybe they, we should connect skills with careers in a more efficient way. Do you have any, um, to Steve's point about his daughters, thoughts about what we should be teaching in our education programs? Like, um, for a long time, all of the emphasis has been on STEM education, and that will equal a job. More recently, there have been people arguing that liberal arts are more important than ever because in the future, as things are changing so quickly, what will be most important is that you think critically and adapt to it. And I'd love to hear um, more from you what you think the most important aspects to educate people to do are. Me? Yeah, Yes, you. sure. Here. Well, it's, it's a, I, it <laughs> really is both of these. Um, um, uh, when I, talk, when, when, when I talk about that thing that went on in Pittsburgh where you smashed art, computer science, and, and uh, shop together, that really is the, the unity of liberal arts and making things. Also, in our society, we've had these as separates. Not only did we have the rise of too much college, perhaps, but we basically said there's people who work with their hands and their blue collar, and we have people who work with their brains and their white collar, um, and they're, they're kind of separate, and they have different cultures, and we just kind of kept making that very different. This is getting much more integrated now. Um, in the future, you can't work with your hands and not use sophisticated tools, sophisticated coding, your programming stuff at CNC machines. Uh, it solves problems better, so it, it gets very mushed back and forth. Uh, and, and that's the reason that this kind of integrated stuff where you're solving a problem, you're using code, it's not as didactic as I'm just in a STEM thing, and I'm solving a design problem and that's full of empathy, that, that seems to work. And you see this in the, in the darndest places, like Yale University turned a library into a maker center and it became full of liberal arts people who started expressing themselves with their hands and making things uh, and that was good. And then, but at the same time, to your point, you, want, you have to layer onto this micro-credentials and the specific things that you're good at because we're disaggregating education. Um, one of the problems even with trade education is you go in for a couple of years and you learn a particular thing, there may be one skill you want to learn. So my friends at Tech Shop, which is a makerspace, are working with uh, people who provide trade education so you can come in, get the credential for the one thing you need, and so the job can say, here are the three things you need and you can do those three things, right? So these smaller, more portable forms of credentials, and maybe they use blockchain to share them with people, and I think this is a lot of the direction that LinkedIn's going in. There's something about that that, that, says, that favors this, this new way of learning, but then teases out the specific things that you're learning. And then 
and then you can start using intelligence to start matching up people who have this and where's, where are careers going, and it might coach them and pull them in, in a direction. In 1964, Marshall McLuhan said that um, uh, the information content inside a classroom is less than outside the classroom, so the student kind of realizes by going to school he interrupts his education. And he said that in 1964, and now we have kind of all of these wonderful tools, so we're kind of a bit mushing together classroom or, and, and not. So yeah, so again, being in, in the survey we did, uh, uh, Markle did with um, Pew, uh, there was a clear indication, uh, A, that, and a clear expectation that um, there's not going to be one skill and it's, you're never going to be uh, skilled uh, forever, right? So you're going to have ongoing, basically, learning as the default. Um, and then there was a whole debate, well, what skills? And again, uh, again, there was a hybrid, uh, but soft and social skills scored higher uh, uh, um, as, a, as, as a perception that this is really what is necessary right now. And again, there's a whole debate about what are social and soft skills, um, but it does indicate that it's not one kind of skill, that's a hybrid. And quite often, to a large extent, it's really the skill of learning that is really necessary and that in an, in an environment where you will have ongoing learning that really will make a difference. And I think that's something that uh, um, even in the makers kind of movement, uh, the skill of learning, the skill of actually going about and acquire rapidly new insights of going about solving a problem, that turns out to be a foundational skill that is necessary in the current age. Yeah. One reason I'm, I'm bullish on maker stuff isn't just, okay, makers make products, but um, this is an attitude. We, you need people in kind of all parts of the nation, all stations in life, including those who think they're not supposed to go get more education and are like want the plant job, to just be thrilled about playing with and learning things. So we have to turn learning into play or do something to diffuse access to advanced knowledge quickly, which is, becomes the security concern. So the maker stuff just, to me, accelerates that. Yeah, a couple of points on that. So um, one layer I would add to your question, Sarah, is about, you know, where are you learning as opposed to, you know, what do you need to learn? And there's definitely a sort of physical and geographical answer to that question. So I'd recommend uh, if people are interested to have a look at LinkedIn's new workforce reports. So mm. we're now releasing these on a quarterly basis to actually look at the sort of uh, the movement of talent and uh, in a geographic uh, framework, but also in skills. And, you know, if I was answering a question, maybe a university student was asking me the the, the answer would be you need to either look into teaching or nursing or being a doctor because those are the three skills that are you know the most high in demand um, but also the way you're learning in terms of you know where are you in your own career trajectory you know do you feel that there's a stigma around you know saying I'm somehow deficient in the knowledge that I need and, and getting past that and also being available to learn in an online environment rather than in a traditional sort of school environment. Um, some of the stuff that we're doing on LinkedIn right now is really fascinating by actually following how people are navigating and consuming news on LinkedIn, what they're saying about their, you know, their previous careers and, and their skills and actually serving them up sort of live content to learn from in a, in a video kind of environment. So this idea of uh, learning by data about what skills and what jobs are going to be available to me where I currently live. Um, getting past that idea of, you know, I'm too long in the tooth to be able to, to pivot and change. And also that idea of I want snackable learning and I want to be able to take maybe a little, a little uh, video that will teach me how to do something right now as opposed to what is the track that I might um, take to change my career and do something entirely different. Uh, the last tool I'll tell you about is the LinkedIn alumni tool, which is fascinating. Uh, we actually track the trajectory. It's part of our, um, our sort of economic graph uh, uh, project, which is about uh, mapping the world's economy. Um, the alumni tool is actually uh, a completely free mm. way to tap in to see how did groups of students navigate their careers and navigate uh, you know, their way around the world. So if I am in Bangalore and I want to get a, a job in Google working in the Silicon Valley, I can actually look at, well, which university degree at home will actually produce the most uh, workers at, at Google over in Silicon Valley and then think about who do I reach out to as a mentor on LinkedIn, for example, that I can then tease out some ideas of what do I do next. So I think this idea of you know, learning and growing uh, needs to, you know, 
be part of our everyday rather than, you know, the first four years of our education before we move into the workforce. Mm. I think we can all agree that um, automation and kind of the pace of technological change will fundamentally change work, and there are ways in which that will be disruptive. Um, but also, there, at the same time, there are opportunities in that. Um, and I was wondering if any of you are excited about it or have something nice to say about automation as we've been um, kind of beating up on it here. Steve, our pessimist on the panel. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, first, I want to th throw in one, one parenthetical thing in terms of this dystopia, that there's an interregnum, right? Right, right now we have extremely low joblessness. Mm -hmm. And the forecast is that, is, that, is that for the next, what, five or ten years, there's going to be a lot of jobs because someone's going to have to teach the robots. has to make the robots and teach the robots. It's sometime in the future when you have the big, this big forecast dip. What am I excited about? I, I think that the um, robotics that's being developed for surgical purposes is very exciting. Uh, for me, I would just say, um, quite simply, the less time that I'm in a queue or a line, as you call it here, waiting to, to purchase something, the quicker that I can get out and, and work on the big ideas, uh, the better. I, I think all of manufacturing and supply chain is undergoing an enormous change, of which robots is just a piece of it. The 20th century was a mass century. The economics were, you needed economies of scale. We all got approximately the same product. The same factors that allow you to build prosthetics or surgical devices or kind of you know, unique high value things will come to much of the economy. Brooklyn Navy Yard is, is pioneering much of that, that stuff here. So I, I'm excited about kind of uh, ever more custom products and more people being able to express them. That GE was an example of that, more local manufacturing. Um, I think this is what happens when the software and idea content of a product goes up, which is what robots allow and artificial intelligence allows, and then the kind of the lower portion of the stack, uh, the, 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 the production and the setting of things up kind of gets automated. Um, th that's, that's painful in the middle for the, for the people who lose their jobs, but it leads to much more creativity. I was at Apple man many years ago when we introduced the laser writer. Um, and when we introduced the laser writer, um, there used to be something called the pre-press business. When you wanted to print something, people went and made sure that it looked right, it was set up right, and it would print properly. And that all got replaced by the printer driver. So when you pull down print, that little thing that talks to the printer, that piece of software eliminated a whole group of jobs. And one year I was sent off to talk to the pre-press association. I had to tell them their jobs would be gone next year. That, that was difficult. Um, but now what's happened is many, many more people make content. We lost the pre-press people, but there's lots more people in the content and design making business because that friction went away. I think that's going to happen to a lot of manufacturing. So I mean, I'm getting excited about um, many of the issues that were discussed as well, but especially the area where AI meets IA, and by which I mean is that where you basically get augmentation uh, um, of um, life. Uh, and that is as a result of both having access to information when you need it, the kind of information that is customized to you, and also ultimately the context in which you consume the information. So that basically, you either augment the job you do or you augment your life in general. And I think that's really an exciting place. The other um, I think we're excited about is that, the, that much of the um, uh, technology does allow you to unbundle the process. And so um, we will see total radical transformation of manufacturing, but it also means uh, radical transformation of how, for instance, you construct a car mm -hmm. or how you construct any kind of product in an unbundled fashion where you actually have more diversity uh, as opposed to the homogeneous kind of context that we are in right now. And I think augmentation plus diversity is really uh, the promise. Um, but again, I don't want to be too uh, Polyanish uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> and still try to be uh, realistic, but that's really what excites me. Great. Um, well, it's been great solving all of the problems and coming up with definitive answers um, with you for the last 45 minutes. And so now that nobody has any other questions about automation and we know exactly what the future is going to hold and how to solve those issues, um, I'd like to just thank you for being here. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute break. We're going to resume at 3.15. Please be in your seats at 3.15. Thank you.